Hello and welcome um, to this webinar. The webinar is held jointly by the Australian Institute for Interpreters and Translators and um, the Migrant and Refugee Health Partnership. Today we will be focusing on the Guide for Clinicians Working with Interpreters in Healthcare Settings, Considerations for Interpreters Working in Health. My name is Anna Kenny and I will be the facilitator for this webinar today. I work with New South Wales Healthcare Interpreter Services as the Professional Development Coordinator. In that role, I develop and facilitate workshops for healthcare interpreters. You may have seen me before in an AUSIT webinar or some of the AUSIT workshops or conferences. So thank you for joining us today for the webinar. Um, in today's webinar, we will present some recent developments uh, with regard to best practice guidelines, guidelines for clinicians working with interpreters. We will also discuss some implications that come out from these guidelines for interpreters. Um, be mindful that this webinar is live and interactive. Um, you're very, very encouraged to type in your questions as they come to your mind. And at the end of the webinar, we will try to answer as many questions as we possibly can. I um, would like to introduce the presenters for the webinar. And um, I have with me today the Associate Professor Christine Phillips and Ms. Gordana Vasik. Um, I will read their very impressive CVs because I wouldn't want to omit anything. So, um, Associate um, Professor Christine Phillips is the convener for um, so of social of the convener of social foundations of medicine with the ANU Medical School. Um, she is the medical director of Companion House Medical Service, which is the ACT's refugee health service. She is a member of the Institute for Communication in Healthcare, a chair of the Refugee Health Network of Australia. She is also a GP with qualifications in anthropology, public health and teaching. For over a decade, Christine has advocated through policy, research and education for better engagement of interpreters in medical settings and improved cross-cultural communication in health. I also have in the studio uh, Gordana Vasik, who is the um, manager of the Healthcare Interpreter Service with Western Sydney Local Health District, the role she has held for the last 10 years, um, having joined the service in 2000. Gordana initially trained as a nurse and later completed a master's degree in agriculture at the University of, in, um, of Sarajevo. Gordana then obtained NATI accreditation as a Serbian translator in 1999 and as a Serbian interpreter in 2000. I would like to welcome Christine and Gordana. We're very lucky to have them with us today. And now I would like to invite Christine um, to introduce the work of the Migrant and Refugee Health Partnership and the background to the development of the guide to working with interpreters in the healthcare settings. Thank you very much, Anna, and uh, it's a great privilege to be here today. Unlike just about ev well, everybody listening at the moment, I am a typical clinician in that I'm monolingual. And so throughout my working career, I've had to rely very, very strongly on the capabilities of interpreters. And so it's been a great delight to be able to work with the sector uh, in the development of these guidelines and, of the, and the framework which we're going to talk to you today. This uh, comes from the Migrant and Refugee Health Partnership, which was established in 2016 in recognition of Australia's uh, major uh, migrant history and the changing demographics that were requiring a strategic health response to this. Australia's population is becoming more diverse and we are the eighth most uh, mono, uh, multilingual country in the world. Uh, so we are one of the great migrant nations of the, of the world. Now, delivering clinical, quality clinical care to, uh, to refugees and migrants in this context is actually increasingly challenging in the health sector and it's very, very important in order to be able to access appropriate and good quality health care that we actually have strong capabilities within the sector and that is culturally responsive. So the partnership was established as a partnership between a number of uh, important leaders in the health sector 
and in government in order to embed cultural responsiveness uh, as part of education, training, continuing professional education and standard setting for clinicians. So what I'm going to talk to you today is firstly about the competency standards framework for clinicians and then we'll move to the practical guide. So the framework was uh, published in January this year and the framework is the first competency standard framework that exists for clinicians. Many of you re listening to this will be very aware that there is in fact a competency standard framework for interpreters. But to date, we haven't had a competency standard framework for clinicians around culturally competent healthcare. So this framework was developed over a couple of years through a collaborative and consultative response, uh, approach and the purpose of it was really to develop uh, really good quality clinical education, training and professional development curricula and competency standards for clinicians that would become embedded in their training. Uh, it's intended to be flexible and it's supposed to apply across a range of healthcare settings and to that end we were very lucky that the, uh, the, the partnership includes nurses, doctors of all different types and allied health professionals. So the key principles of the framework are that it should be person-centred and family-focused care, that access and equality and equity were important, that quality and safety were important, that we would uh, uh, recognise the dignity of all the people that we work with and that we would respect that and that we would have good and effective communication. The framework is structured across seven domains, which uh, draws on the a Canadian framework called CanMeds. And the idea about this framework is that it, it tries to describe the different types of domains in which a clinician should be competent. The uh, purpose of really tying it to this framework is that it is the framework that is used in developing uh, education for all existing specialists and for GPs as well. So it's a highly recognised set of uh, domains in terms of clinical competency. And you can see that the theme of effective communication cuts right across all of these domains. That's really important in Australia that uh, we focused particularly on the roles of interpreters, which uh, we'll be talking about in some detail. We already know that in uh, clinical care, despite Australia having amongst the most accessible interpreter system in the world, uh, interpreters used in about 1% of consultations where they should be used. And that reflects uh, clinicians' uh, inability to really recognise and use them as part of mainstream practice. And our aim here, quite ambitiously, is to try and make this part of mainstream practice. And you may say, how can we do that? Uh, and I think this is the first time, and I've worked in this sector for 30 years now, so it's the first time that I've seen the num this, a number of stakeholders actually endorsing a framework. You can see that this has been endorsed by a large number of medical colleges, including emergency medicine, sports and exercise physicians, anaesthetists, rural and remote medicine, medical administrators, surgeons, physicians, obstetricians, gynaecologists, ophthalmologists, psychiatrists, pathologists and dermatologists. The framework's been mapped onto the curriculum for general practice, which means that all general practitioner registrars in training will need to be familiar with this uh, framework and how to put it into practice. And it's been further endorsed by the Confederation of Postgraduate Medical Education Councils, which is the overarching umbrella organisation over postgraduate education for clinicians, three general practice training organisations, which is all of them in this country, and the colleges of midwives, nursing and mental health. Uh, so this is potentially transformative and it's a great privilege to be involved with the development of it and to be here speaking to you about it today. We're really going to focus today on the guide, which uh, is a complementary resource to the framework. The guide deals particularly with communication and uh, it's intended to be 
of use when the patient and the doctor do not speak the same language. This includes uh, Auslan and it includes deaf interpreting for uh, our patients who may not speak or use Auslan. Um, it provides a series of recommended approaches and evidence-based good practice points for working with interpreters. Uh, now, it is aimed at clinicians. I, I, I realise that this may seem a little odd to you because uh, it's coming... I'm t talking to you today about something that is aimed at clinicians. But I think it's important to know what we regard as best practice for clinicians, and this was developed uh, in consultation with interpreters. In fact, Gordana, who's here with me, was critical in the development of this. In particular, uh, it establishes that interpreters are clinic non-clinical members of the healthcare team. And much of what we are going to be talking about is how that partnership with the, the clinician and the interpreter, what we can expect in a really good quality uh, patient-centred consultation and how the clinician should be fostering that. The guide is divided into five sections and they set out recommended approaches for clinicians which are in turn related to the standards within the framework. They are five key points. Uh, they begin with why it is a clinician should engage an interpreter. Uh, they move on to determining interpreter need and requirement, that is the need for a patient for interpreters, uh, about engaging an interpreter. It addresses the interpreter's role and scope of practice very important for clinicians to have this clear in their heads. And it ends with some practice points for clinicians working with interpreters in healthcare settings. So we'll begin with uh, the uh, why one should engage an interpreter. And I'm going to be talking here in some ways about why I would, how I would be trying to push this point with clinicians. Um, now we know that people uh, with limited English proficiency uh, recognise they have to have poorer health outcomes and substandard contacts with healthcare providers. They tend to have limited access to care and preventive services and they're at risk of severe adverse outcomes during and immediately after hospital admission. Now, that can very, very frequently be tied to poor communication. Now, failure to determine if an interpreter is needed and to engage one in consultations with patients uh, who have limited English proficiency or deaf people may and probably will be considered a breach of duty of care by the clinician. Uh, and in this country, there have been some very high profile cases which are very well known amongst clinicians around the failure or uh, adverse outcomes as a result of failure to recognise and engage with an interpreter. And in particular, uh, clinicians' medical legal defence organisations are unable to be supportive of uh, any, a clinician who should have used an interpreter and didn't. Um, uh, and in particular, these, there are three cases. We, I usually refer to those as three Cs. Uh, that are really important from a medical legal perspective and in which if a clinician did not use an interpreter when they were needed, they would have to explain why. And they are informed consent uh, when decisions are particularly com complex and issues when the, uh, the patient uh, may have uncertain competence to make their decisions. Internationally, the major driver for increased uh, drivers of clinicians using interpreters has been the medical legal uh, implications of not using interpreters and the medical defence organisations in this country are very active in trying to drive this agenda. We know that if you engage with an interpreter there will be decreased communication errors, that's uh, self-evident I think. It will increase the person's comprehension it will reduce unnecessary tests and treatments. And the reason for that is if we engage with a patient who has limited English proficiency, clinicians tend to diagnose by testing. And that is a very wasteful process to engage with rather than diagnosing by communication and examination, which is what we're supposed to do. Um, 
It certainly improves clinical outcomes. It raises the quality of care to the same level as that for people without language barriers, and that should be an aim of an equitable health system. It improves the person's satisfaction and it improves the health care provider's satisfaction. I always, uh, uh, in teaching this issue, um, I always say that the, the person who needs the interpreter is not the patient. The person who needs the interpreter is the clinician. Mm -hmm. And so all of those questions when they, they on hospital uh, files, they always say, does the patient need an interpreter? Whether or not the patient needs the interpreter, I'm pretty sure that in those situations, the clinician will need the interpreter. So it's a matter of good practice that the patient should understand the discussion that takes place and the proposed care plan. That's within our, that's our duty of care to be able to explain those properly uh, and to uh, avoid the harms that many clinical treatments can, uh, can cause if there hasn't been sufficient explanation of them. Uh, engaging an interpreter is, is critical for informed consent um, and also for deciding whether a patient is actually competent to make decisions. The, the area that clinicians often struggle with is actually complex instructions. They, they do understand that uh, they, are in, they should be getting uh, an interpreter for in, to get adequate informed consent, even if sometimes they don't. But they often uh, don't understand when instructions are so complex that a person can't understand them. Uh, and typical issues where instructions go wrong and an interpreter shouldn't, should have been used are uh, discussions about medication, discussions about how the PBS works, so how someone is going to be able to go to a, a, a pharmacy and actually get a repeat of their script, and decisions about management when they are leaving hospital. These are all examples where it's highly important that uh, in a case with somebody with limited English proficiency that they actually think about that and think about accessing one. Now, I'm now going to hand over to Gordana, who's going to discuss guidance around the establishment of when an interpreter is needed and their requirements. Thank you very much, Christine, for giving us an overview of the framework from the clinician's perspective. Before I start, I just wanted to acknowledge that the most important part of this framework to me as an interpreter is the fact that interpreters have been recognised as equally important members of all healthcare teams, and I think that's a great win for interpreters. I also wish to acknowledge that this framework has been endorsed by NATI and also by our professional bodies such as OZIT and ASLIA. Um, let me now talk about the need for interpreters. So, in in practice, a legitimate assessment of a need for an interpreter may be done by a clinician or by the patient. And in both cases, interpreters should be engaged. While the, inter while the patient may, have, uh, may be able to engage in a very simple, everyday conversation in English, they may not necessarily have a good understanding of complex medical issues. And their language, language might be, English language might be insufficient to understand uh, medical terminology, to understand technical terms, to understand procedures, to understand the pharmaceutical information, to ask the questions and to understand what the impact of their illness might be on their entire life. So it is therefore also important to mention here that, um, that they may not be that the need for an interpreter may not uh, be deemed necessary at the very beginning of a consultation, but sometimes, or the order procedure for that fact, but sometimes if the clinician realizes that the circumstances change during the consultation or during the procedure, they should be prepared to uh, engage an interpreter at that time. So we are now going to move to the next um, uh, section, which is uh, talking about the risks of uh, relying on personally involved individuals or technology. Uh, we are very much aware that there is a high level of ethical, professional and legal consequences and possible adverse outcomes for patients if the clinician fails to engage an interpreter and instead engages family or, fam family or friends or, or intimate partners to act as interpreters or they may even uh, use web-based uh, translation tools. Uh, communication errors, we are very much aware, can lead to poor health outcomes because the clinicians may make wrong clinical decisions as a result of poor communication. 
clinicians should be aware that if the family or friends are engaged in um, the clinical setting, uh, they may not interpret accurately because they don't have skills of interpreters and they don't know medical terminology. So the clinicians may actually uh, have, their confidence may be undermined in what is actually being interpreted to that patient through the family or friends. Also, clinicians should be aware that family members are not bound by the professional code of ethics or friends are not bound by the professional code of ethics and therefore confidentiality might become a big issue. Family and friends can also be personally or emotionally involved. For instance, in case of domestic violence, some family members may be personally involved or in case of a terminal illness, uh, family members may be very much emotionally involved and affected. And there is a reality that if you engage family and friends to interpret for your patients, uh, the fact is that it has impact on them. That, that actually can cause trauma to, to them. Uh, what GUIDE is very strong about, the GUIDE we are talking about here, it, it is actually very strong against, strongly against its preaching strongly against use of children uh, to, for interpreting purposes uh, because it's particularly problematic and it, has, it is associated with a large number of ethical and cultural dilemmas. So going back to the other alternative to using family and friends, sometimes clinicians may opt to use web-based translation tools. And while these are becoming more prominent recently and they are improving, the reality is that this guide is actually advising against use of such web-based tools because they, are, they haven't been proven to provide safe and uh, accurate translations necessary for complex medical settings. So clinicians are actually uh, uh, warned not to use these uh, web-based translations or tools. We are now moving to... Um, uh, we, to uh, Another aspect which, is, uh, which clinicians commonly experience, you as an interpreter wouldn't be aware of, but there are times where actually patients refuse to have an interpreter present, and that could be for a range of reasons, and very often it's related to them questioning interpreters' confidentiality, or they might not be happy with the gender of an interpreter that has been assigned for them, um, or they, they might be concerned about the cost of interpreter services. While the service is free, most of the time patients actually don't, are, not, are not aware of that. So the guide clarifies that the, that the clinician should always talk to a patient and make sure that they discuss all their concerns. They also have to emphasize to the patient that there are risks, potential risks of miscommunication uh, or uh, misunderstanding. They also have to emphasize that uh, there are not the benefits for, of using an interpreter are not just for the patient, they are also to the benefit of the clinician. And uh, very important for patients, the clinician should state to them that family members and friends are always welcome to be present in the consultation room while the interpreter is there. There are also times when clinicians may not be able to engage an interpreter and that could happen in cases when there is no interpreter available in a particular language or there is an interpreter available. However, uh, we wouldn't be able to provide an interpreter of a particular gender or of a particular um, a dialect. So in those cases, it's the responsibility of a clinician to document in the patient's file that the interpreter wasn't present, and also to note what kind of language support was provided instead. So now we are going to talk about engaging an interpreter. So we established that there is a need for an interpreter. We established that it's not appropriate to engage family members and friends as interpreters. Now we are talking about engaging interpreters. When clinicians engage interpreters, they have to take into account a number of things. Uh, first of all, considerations, uh, patients' considerations and preferences. Uh, those considerations are related mainly to uh, the language or the dialect they speak, to their religion, to their ethnicity, to the gender of interpreter they may prefer, etc. 
There are times when patients would prefer to have the same interpreter for ongoing consultations and this is perfectly fine, especially in mental health consultations uh, or for instance in situations when, interpreter, when the patient was a survivor of torture and trauma and ongoing counselling would be required. So sending the same interpreter in those circumstances would be very appropriate. There are also times when the patient might require to have the same gender, a particular gender of an interpreter. Um, this is particularly uh, specific for the consultations that are related to, to sexual health or reproductive health. And there are many cases in many cultures when women really prefer to have a female interpreter when they are going to their antenatal care or for, for birth. Uh, there are patients who may question confidentiality of their interpreters, especially if they come from very close, tight-knit or small communities. And in those cases, uh, clinicians should opt to engage a telephone interpreter. And especially in Australia, there is a telephone interpreting service, so it's th the likelihood of getting someone from a different state is very high, and therefore the patient wouldn't know that interpreter, nor the interpreter would know the patient. Um, the fact is that despite our best attempt to meet all requirements of a patient, we may not uh, actually meet all their preferences. So the role of a clinician in that case is actually to have a discussion with the patient, to advise them what options are available, to advise them of the role of an interpreter, and that way to develop trust with the patient and also develop effective partnership uh, uh, with, with their patient. Moving on to the next slide, which is talking about facilitating engagement of interpreters. Uh, so the clinicians are those who are facilitating engagement of interpreters. And when they talk to patients, they have to make sure that they advise the patient that the interpreter services are free, that they are confidential, that the interpreter would uh, provide uh, accurate interpreting services, that that the interpreter is a certified interpreter and also that the patient has right to access an interpreter no matter where they receive their uh, health care in private or public sector or when they are collecting their medicine. It is also important for clinicians when they work with their fellow colleagues to ensure that they all know how to assess the need for interpreter, how to engage an interpreter in a timely manner how to document the, uh, the need for an interpreter in patient's uh, electronic or paper medical record, and also how to create an alert for future uh, consultations so that someone can engage an interpreter and book them for future consultations. We are now moving to the next segment, which is talking about the interpreter's role and the scope of practice. So this guide um, that we've been talking about uh, has established that interpreters are non-clinical members of all healthcare teams. And clinicians should collaborate with interpreters as, as team members, recognizing their skills, their responsibilities and scope of practice. Clinicians should not expect interpreters to perform any tasks that might be outside of their interpreting role. For instance, clinicians should not expect interpreters to... Uh, sorry, I didn't <laughs> move to... <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so clinicians shouldn't, accept, uh, shouldn't um, uh, expect from interpreters to assess the... Uh, patients' functional abilities. Uh, they can uh, uh, actually assess their linguistic abilities, but not their functional abilities. They shouldn't expect interpreters to make judgment about patients' competence or to establish the patient's understanding. They also don't need, they can't expect interpreters to act as a chaperone in clinical examinations. Uh, they also can't expect them to act as health advocates for patients. They can't expect them to translate material in a consultation or to fill in the forms or questionnaires on behalf of the patient. So while interpreters do remove uh, communication barriers, 
it is actually uh, it is actually the responsibility of the treating clinician to establish the understanding. And uh, because this is a topic very close to uh, Christine's heart, I'm going to hand it over to her to elaborate on that more. Thanks, thanks, Gordana. And, and it's true, it is very close to my clinical heart, this, uh, the importance of getting proper consent and not treating the interpreter as a, a bi bicultural worker or a cultural advocate for the patient. This is... Um, uh, a trap, I think, that many clinicians fall into and one of the big um, uh, ambitions that we have for this guide and the fact that so many uh, in the health sector have signed up to it and endorsed it is to clarify it's, um, the, the correct and reasonable roles of an interpreter. Now, importantly, I think this is... Uh, it is not an interpreter's role to ever obtain consent for a patient. Mm. Almost everybody who's worked in, in a hospital setting as an interpreter will have experience of a clinician handing them a long form and saying, yes. you interpret that and down the bottom sign it. And some very conscientious interpreters will not want to sign a form that's, uh, that they haven't interpreted, which is, is good. But from a, a legal perspective, the consent taking, the getting of consent, is the responsibility of the clinician. And the clinician cannot actually pass that role off legally to an interpreter. It is the clinician's role to actually go through the form and read it out in whichever ways and, and paraphrase it if necessary, work out whether the patient can understand it and use the interpreter to assist with communication, but not to actually interpret the consent form. That, that, and uh, interpreters should resist that. It, it, uh, um, it is medical legally the responsibility still uh, uh, depends on the clinician, but it, it is far too great a responsibility to throw upon an interpreter. That, that's my one thing. The second th um, issue really around these consent relates to other areas where written material is sometimes given to an interpreter to read in full to a patient and, and a good example of that is clinical trials <laughs> where the, the uh, paperwork can go for pages and pages and pages. Now, uh, actually that is just a piece of laziness on the part of the clinician. It's exhausting to read out a clinical trial but it, <laughs> material but uh, the ethics committee has not signed off on the ethics of that trial on the basis that you will be the one doing the uh, getting the consent. It is the role of the person who is working for the clinician to get that consent. So um, those two issues, I think, are, are highly improper uh, gaining of consent, and particularly for procedures, it's uh, an illegal mode of gaining consent. There we are. This uh, now leads us on to these issues about uh, site translations and filling out forms. And just to clarify, you shouldn't be expected to fill out forms or questionnaires. Those forms and questionnaires still are the um, responsibility of the clinician. Um, uh, it is occasionally the case that uh, you will be asked to do on-site site, uh, translations of written material and there are some occasions where that's actually very important, where uh, there may not be much uh, time and in which the clinician actually does need that information relatively quickly. So some examples might be uh, immunisation forms. It would be useful for us to know in a situation where somebody has uh, a, 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 an, an evolving infection, whether or not they had been immunised against these materials. And so a site translation uh, should be something that it's not, it's not actually an unreasonable thing to ask of an interpreter. Having said that, usually um, some of the, it, the... One of the reasons it's easy is because the immunisations are the same the world round, so that an interpreter can probably read something. If they say BCG we will all know that that is an uh, immunisation against tuberculosis. The other case in which a site translation might be useful is when patients have past documents and we might be trying to work out if they have had uh, a procedure that is relevant. An example is if they've had an appendicectomy and you're worried that the person has got an appendicitis. Uh, so it may be that you are asked to do a site translation not of the operative procedure but of whether or not they actually have a record of ever having had that procedure. 
And now we're aware that some people, sometimes the descriptions of uh, uh, operations can be far too complex to expect uh, any interpreter who isn't also a clinician to be able to interpret. Nevertheless, that's a stopgap solution that may be um, useful. I think they're, they're the only occasions when you might be asked to uh, do a site translation and in which uh, that would be actually quite an important thing to do. Most occasions uh, for, site, for translations, they should really go off to a formal translator if that's what's required, particularly for psychiatric documents. Don't, don't site translate those. <laughs> Over to you, Gordon. Okay. So we are now going to talk about the practice points for clinicians working with interpreters in healthcare settings. And this guide, the uh, section five of this guide, has nine points, nine practice points. I will be talking about the first couple of points that are in relation to briefing and um, and uh, uh, introducing the interpreter. Uh, well, then Christine will take over and speak uh, about next four points and then I'll come back. Uh, so the first uh, point is about the briefing and the importance of briefing and interpreters. So interpreters should be given an opportunity to know about the nature of the consultation prior to uh, the start of the consultation. It also helps with the quality and um, uh, and the effective communication and can and will eventually lead to better patient outcomes. Um, briefing an interpreter is particularly important when we have very complex consultations. So, for instance, a clinician may uh, brief an interpreter before the consultation and advise them that the patient has speech defects, and that's important for interpreter to know before they start interpreting. Um, they should also be briefed when it comes to very complex consultations, and these could be um, consultations related to mental health, to uh, end-of-life discussions, or when the clinician is going to deliver a bad news to the patient or the family. Uh, also, the briefing should occur at the time when um, a, some form of occupational risk might be uh, anticipated uh, in the setting, for example, uh, in relation to possible uh, domestic violence or abuse. Um, the Ozit Code of Ethics is actually suggesting that interpreters should be very proactive in seeking uh, briefing whenever it is possible. Uh, it is also recognized that when you do phone interpreting or video interpreting, the opportunities for briefing are very limited. However, that shouldn't stop the clinician to flag with you uh, what the topic of a consultation or topic of conversation would be. Uh, and if the consultation moves towards the issues that you might not be aware of, you can always do an ad hoc briefing with the clinician. So the next um, point, uh, the, the practice point, is talking about introducing the interpreter. So it is the role of the clinician uh, to introduce the interpreter to the patient and they should introduce them by saying that they are a member, or they are a, a member of the healthcare team, that they are bound by the professional code of ethics and that they would uh, everything said in the room will remain confidential, they are impartial, they will interpret, every, uh, interpret everything ac accurately. Alternatively, a clinician can offer this to interpreters, so the interpreter can introduce themselves to the patient and explain their role. Uh, clinicians should never expect interpreters or should never ask interpreter not to interpret a particular segment that they've just said or they shouldn't ask interpreter not to interpret what they were just discussing with another clinician in the presence of the patient. Um, if the clinician, and it may happen, sometimes need to have an exchange with an interpreter, they should also allow an interpreter time to interpret that exchange to the patient so the patient is kept in the loop at all times. And also what is important when a clinician leaves the room, the, patient, the interpreter shouldn't be left with the patient in the room. The clinician should actually invite the interpreter to leave the room at the same time. So now I will hand it back to uh, Christine, who will be talking about her other favorite topic, which is debriefing. Debriefing. <laughs> uh, 
Um, this was a, a rather uh, contentious issue when we were d preparing the guide. Um, not because we didn't think it was important. We did think it was important. We just spent quite a lot of time thinking about what the nature of reasonable debriefing was. So a debriefing occurs after a consultation and during a debrief or feedback, a clinician may ask the uh, interpreter to provide some feedback on the way that the person spoke or other linguistic characteristics. It's often very useful to know that the person stutters, actually, and sometimes it's hard as a clinician to know what linguistic yeah. defects the person yeah. has had. And uh, uh, sometimes the interpreter in the middle of the consultation will say, it's hard to understand this, I think he's stuttering. But sometimes they won't, and sometimes it's useful to actually, at the end of that, for us to stop and say, I what, it was very hard for him to start his language, his, his words. Was he stuttering in your language? Um, does he actually... The parents are saying this person can't articulate. Is he actually lisping his S's? If I'm not familiar with that language, I may actually miss aspects of that. So it's important to use... Here we're using the interpreter simply as a speech expert, but I think that's a useful uh, uh, role for them. Um, we might ask them to, to... We might have a debrief about the person's body language and gestures. Not that I'm seeking a clinical opinion, but it may be useful to talk about that. And importantly, and this is really the, the, the reason why I do care about debriefing, is about reflecting on the distressing or disturbing experiences that may have occurred in some consultations. Uh, some, particularly those which may potentially uh, uh, make themselves... make place both of you, both of us, at risk of potential vicarious trauma. Now, debriefing is a fairly simple issue, and if we were having a complex consultation in, in, in my general practice and the nurse was present afterwards, I would spend a little bit of time just talking about that with the nurse, the two of us together, simply to acknowledge the complexity and potential stressfulness of the consultation. And I think it's important that uh, the same professional courtesy and respect is extended to interpreters. And in, in the event of telephone interpreting, I, I, I will often, after a very complicated consultation, or which one, one which hasn't gone where I thought it was going to go, I'll often thank the uh, interpreter and then uh, um, the patient will leave and then I'll say, stay on the line. <laughs> <laughs> because I think we just it would be useful for both of us to acknowledge uh, that that was a difficult consultation. I'm not talking about formal debriefing here. Uh, the formal debriefing of uh, dangerous consultations or risky consultations is, is the responsibility of your employing agency, just like it's the same for the mm. clinicians. But as a matter of mutual respect between two people involved in the, the consultation, I think it's really valuable. And I'm going to give... Am I going to give a case study? Yes, I'm going to give a case study. So this is uh, drawn from... Uh, a, a clinical case. This is not the person's name, this is not his, his background, but uh, this is the way the consultation uh, e evolved. Uh, it's the story of a man named Karim, who, uh, whose uh, recurring refrain through this consultation was, nobody knows what I've seen in his own language, and the interpreter had to keep interpreting this. So in this case study, you can see that I've written what, what uh, in, uh, uh, on, on the left column what was like for the, uh, uh, the person, the, a doctor, and on the right, the uh, interpreter's experience. So here we have a 58-year-old Bosnian-Australian. Um, the interpreter is in the room. It's an on-site interpreted consultation. She introduces herself, sits, sits beside Karim, and they are both facing the GP. This is just a standard, regular consultation with the GP. Any, deep, any briefing beforehand would have, would have been, this is, the, this is his regular consultation and he's going to come in for his blood pressure medication. <laughs> um, he doesn't seem to talk very much. Uh, the interpreter notices that he's answering in short sentences. She actually doesn't know this person, so she doesn't know whether that's normal for him or not. The GP opens the consultation with the usual review of blood pressure and diabetes, takes the blood pressure, checks that there's enough medication. There's nothing complicated about this. Then, after about 10 minutes, Kareem begins to weep and he discloses that his wife has breast cancer and he's afraid that she will die. It's very clear. The interpreter can see that the GP hasn't heard before that uh, this bad news about his wife. 
Karim's speech becomes more pressured and rapid and he starts describing all kinds of experiences in great detail, not just about his wife, but now he starts talking about his experiences in a concentration camp in Sarajevo where he starved and he nearly died. It's also clear to the interpreter that the, cons the, the uh, clinician didn't know this either. Um, so there's a, 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 an explosion of information that is coming out about this man's past life in the context of his, this devastating information he's had about his wife. The interpreter is now rushing along to interpret uh, completely new information in a distressing environment. Uh, at one point, Karim starts to weep and reaches blindly out and grasps the interpreter's hand. We get to the end of the consultation. It's twice as long as expected and both interpreter and GP are exhausted at its end. We've got to a point where uh, we've tried to arrange uh, a counselling referral and re organised to see him again. But this is not what either the interpreter or the GP had expected when the consultation ended. So now I'll turn to Gordana, my colleague, and say in a consultation like that, which many people have had, what would be an effective debriefing process for you? Um, it's interesting that you, um, you prepared this case because I had very similar experience um, coming from uh, a war-torn country. I was e interpreting for a particular patient for a year and a half and it was, a, it was quite a distressing experience that she was sharing in a consultation session with Starts counsellor. And for me, I, I was actually requested to interpret for the continuation and as I mentioned earlier, patients require the same interpreter for those very sensitive and difficult consultations. So I was requested by starts and I would interpret for the same client for a year and a half every Tuesday. And uh, it was at one stage towards the end that it was taking a toll on me because I survived the war and experience of, uh, uh, of um, her sharing that experience in, in, in uh, counselling mm. sessions and me using the first person and saying what she was experiencing, which was quite horrible, um, uh, would make me be quite distressed a couple of days after each, consult each uh, of those assignments. And then I would be dreading the next session on, on the following mm. week on Tuesday as they were getting closer, I would become more anxious until the point where I literally broke down at one of the sessions and started to cry to mm. a counsellor. And she spent time with me, made sure that we had 10 minutes talk and she, I talked about my feelings. The reality is that both the counsellor and myself were questioned for a year and a half about the confidentiality. So the, the client wasn't just questioning myself, she was questioning the, the counsellor, which made me feel a little bit better because both of us were in the same boat. So she didn't trust both of us despite this relationship of a year and a half. Uh, and the reality is that I couldn't share it with anyone. I couldn't share it. I just had to digest that and keep it within myself. Couldn't share it with the family or yeah. anyone. Yeah. But there came a point where I actually broke down and I had this lengthy conversation after the session that was a debrief for me for the first time in my life without knowing that I'm being debriefed. So that was my experience. And I... Uh, I then went back to work and I spoke to my manager and I was given time off for the rest of the day and I was actually um, uh, generously offered to see the starts counsellor for, for myself. Uh, so I was given a few sessions uh, with the counsellor but it only took me two sessions to actually go through through my grief because obviously I was I was experiencing vicarious trauma, mm. but it made enormous difference to me because I was then able to deal with the grief that I was hearing about on a weekly mm. basis and with my own grief mm. uh, because of the war experience. Mm. Um, so after that, uh, I think that something good came about uh, out of that. Uh, we worked closely with STARTS. We developed the guidelines for interpreters working in those traumatic uh, uh, sessions, especially with STARTS. So those guides have been in place uh, for, for many years. 
and we now make sure that we do look after our interpreters and if they go through those difficult sessions, especially at starts for torture and, and, and trauma survival, the, the service which is actually um, for treatment and rehabilitation of torture and trauma survivors, we, we make sure that interpreters do get time off if they need a break. We make sure that they have breaks in between appointments if they have consecutive appointments at starts. And, and we do acknowledge that patients or clients at starts do do request the same interpreter, but we have to be careful not to burn them out. That's right. And sometimes you may not be the right interpreter. Sometimes exactly. it, it's important to say I've done... I, I remember on the, I was about to launch into a, uh, a, a mental health consultation and the interpreter on the phone said, I've done three today. I think that's enough. Yes. <laughs> she said, I can't do another one. Uh, and I think that's really important that she was able to say that. In fact, two a day is probably enough of those kinds of consultations. Um, uh, so I th I th the majority of these kinds of consultations are going to occur not at starts, not at a refugee to torture and trauma place, but in mainstream general practice, since given the number of survivors of war that have come to Australia as part of our migrant population. So it is very important, I think, for clinicians, and this is one of the teaching points here, is that if you have found the consultation difficult, well, then the interpreter has to. And it's important that you... Uh, regularly, uh, don't, don't wait till it's ex there's an explosion or until the interpreter is weeping as well, that, or that you, the clinician, feel like weeping, that at the end of a, each consultation you say, well, that was a bit difficult, wasn't it? That was hard. Um, I think I'll just go out and walk in the sun for a little bit. Yes. They are useful acknowledgements of our experiences. Yes. Mm. So... I'm just going to move on to some more practical issues uh, about um, working... Uh, I'll just skip something. Working with telephone interpreters. And um, I think here, the, the, the issues here around working with telephone interpreters, the majority of uh, interpreted consultations in this country are done by phone, not in person. And, uh, and the majority of them actually occur in general practice, which is a very busy time-pressured environment, hence uh, telephone interpreters are quite valuable because you never know when you might need somebody and so you can get them at quite short notice. Um, we are told in general practice, and it is actually a requirement of accrediting, of accrediting general practices, that they have speaker phones so that, uh, um, that they, they're not um, handing a, a, a hand piece from one to another, which is very wasteful. and in uh, time pressure general practice will uh, inevitably extend the consultation a great deal. Plus, uh, it stops uh, the clinician from being able to do things at the same time if they, one of their hands is held up by a phone. So um, as far as possible, we always encourage uh, um, settings that are going to use interpreters and we'll be using phone interpreters to always be using a speakerphone. Um, everybody who's ever been an interpreter for on a... A, a, um, a remote consultation will be familiar with the, how irritating it is when a clinician says, "Take this, then this." On how yes. much? How many tablets? Are, uh, uh, how often do you take this medicine compared to this medicine? <laughs> and uh, clearly, what is needed is for the, the clinician to actually be using a bit of visual language. The tablet, the packet that I'm holding up now. How many tablets do you take of that one? And the packet that I'm holding up now is the one where you have to take two every night in my left hand. And so that, uh, not giving visual cues is, um, is a real trap that clinicians can fall into. And it's one of the reasons why people, clinicians prefer on-site interpreters to phone interpreters, actually their own uh, inexperience with using phone interpreters and then using visual language. Um, so the visual language, they have to describe much more what they're doing. Yes. Nevertheless, it, it is, from a clinician's perspective, actually the most efficient way of working with interpreters. So they, they need to get their heads around how to do that properly. Um, and you will find, and we teach, that uh, when they, you have a three-part cons consultation with an interpreter, that the interpreter needs to be addressed directly as interpreter, since you can't look at them. So it's imp important that you that they are addressed as interpreter. Now, a person on the phone has as much right to be briefed beforehand about the consultation and to debrief, be debriefed afterwards as, um, as somebody who's in the room. And um, although one of the, the evidence does suggest that if you're a phone interpreter, you can actually uh, deal with complex emotional consultations um, 
uh, more of them in a day than uh, somebody who's in the room for the same reasons that Gordana has just described about how distressing it can be to have your hand grasped by someone who's weeping. Um, uh, nevertheless, we, we should be aware we, and we shouldn't exploit that capability and an, in -person on the, an interpreter on the phone should and can say, I can't do this anymore. I can't do another one of these consultations. That is an utterly professional thing to do. Uh, but if you are on the phone and your, interpret your clinician is speaking far too fast, uh, please feel free to slow them down and to say, please, can you use more visual language? <laughs> I don't know what you're pointing to. And, uh, and also, you should expect that the clinician tells you how many people are in the room. Otherwise, it's very difficult to understand who's talking. So they should, they should set the scene for you. I'm here with um, a mum and she's got her daughter and her husband is walking in and out and neither the husband nor the mum speak English, but the daughter speaks a bit. We're going to be speaking to the mum. That is going to that's that kind yes. of useful scene setting yes. is um, uh, what you should expect and what we will be teaching with this guide. Over to you. Yes, great. Okay, so I'm now coming back to the last few practice points for clinicians, and they are do, mainly dealing with the speech. Um, and here we are talking about the importance of clinicians when they uh, work with interpreters to speak slowly, uh, sorry, to speak basically clearly, uh, to try to use very uh, plain English when explaining complex medical concepts, to avoid jargon, um, to recognize the fact that uh, interpreters may not have an equivalent for all terms that they are using because it simply doesn't exist in their language. I was amazed many years ago when we recruited our Dinka interpreter for the first time that they didn't have equivalent for antibiotic. And that's such a common uh, medical term, but the, it doesn't exist in, in that particular language. Uh, so in those cases when interpreters can't find the equivalent, the clinicians should be aware that the interpreter will have to paraphrase and therefore it will look as if they are interpreting something much longer than what they said. Uh, they also have to recognize, clinicians have to recognize that there will be times when you as an interpreter will have to put your hand up and ask for clarification or for repetition. Um, clinicians work in a, a range of settings and sometimes they will be assessing the patients for um, intimate and sexual, uh, sexual and, and reproductive health matters. So in those cases, it's very important for a clinician to advise the patient through the interpreter that they might be asking them very sensitive questions and that they might be using vocabulary which would be describing some very intimate parts of the body and um, acts. So it might be uh, important to, uh, to alert the patient so they don't feel uncomfortable in those situations. Mm. And uh, to the final point uh, uh, for me today, we are still talking about the speech. Uh, it's very important <coughs> that when clinicians speak to the patient, because the interpreter is present, that they speak slowly, but they speak naturally. Um, they also speak in manageable, uh, seg manageable chunks, manageable segments. They have to pause to give time to you to interpret everything accurately and they have to avoid overlapping uh, speech. This is important for clinicians to be aware of, despite the fact that you as an interpreter have a range of strategies that you can use to deal with the lengthy speech or overlapping speech, such as note taking, such as cutting in, such as using uh, simultaneous interpreters, such as stopping and asking for clarification or asking both parties to speak one at a time. Um, but if also in the situation when clinicians might be talking among each other or they talk to the family, they, are, they really don't need to give the interpreter a turn to talk because in such situations interpreters would be keeping their patients um, uh, linguistically present by using simultaneous interpreting or whispering mode or what we call shushatash. So I'm now handing it Back to Christine or to Anna. Anna, Anna. Anna. <laughs> it's um, back to me now, um, and I would like to thank Christine and Cordana.
for a very comprehensive overview of the guide and I have to say that they actually offered us a lot more than an overview of the guide. <laughs> So I would like to thank Gordana for sharing um, your personal experience of interpreting. Um, that was um, very touching and I'm sure that a lot of interpreters can relate to what you were describing. So it's very important for, um, for our webinar participants to hear that. But I would also like to ask um, to thank Christine um, for the presentation and when um, Christine was speaking, I was thinking if only all doctors were like Christine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if only all doctors um, that we work with um, understood so well how to work with interpreters and give us briefing and debriefing and so on. But in particular, um, I refer to working over the telephone. Um, I run telephone interpreting workshops and so often I hear interpreters saying that uh, health providers and patients don't know how to work with interpreters over the telephone and that makes our life terribly difficult. So if health providers could set the scene up for us every time, uh, if they could explain who is present, if they could use that descriptive language and the visual cues that Christine um, was talking about, wouldn't our life of interpreters over the phone be so much easier? Um, and yes, a briefing is possible over the phone and so is a debrief. You might have heard Christine saying to the interpreter, uh, please stay on the line if she realises that the interpreter might mm. have been um, affected by what happened in the consultation. Now before I go to your questions, I've got a few questions here. Um, I would like to just highlight some of the significant considerations and implications for in the interpreters that stem for this guide, from this guide. Um, first of all, I'm extremely impressed um, with the recognition of interpreters as non-clinical members of the health team. It's really important for us to be um, recognised as equals in the healthcare team and our role in facilitating communication. Now, secondly, it's so important to, for interpreters to understand the impact of clear communication on clinical outcomes. And when I train interpreters, um, particularly at the beginning of their career, but also in the advanced workshops too, we talk about communication and the uh, impact on the patient's outcomes and how important it is for interpreters not to be intrusive in the, that communication, but to actually facilitate the rapport building between the clinician and the patient, because it actually makes the patients better, <laughs> quicker. So um, it has um, an impact on how we interpret on the modes and techniques that we use. Um, the other um, aspect that the uh, guide recognises is um, that the interpreters can raise cross-cultural misunderstandings and comprehension of cognitive, cognitive difficulties. Because sometimes interpreters wonder, is it my role to talk about it? Is it my role to raise it? Am I interfering if I say anything about it? But it is important for the clinicians to know. Very importantly, and we've got a comment on this in the questions, um, the briefing, obtaining a briefing for an interpreter is extremely important and we want most of our clinicians, all of our clinicians to give us a briefing before we start. So you can actually refer to these guidelines um, as, a, um, as in support of asking for briefing when you need to ask when it's not offered. Then um, the guide recognise introductions and explaining the role of the interpreter is very important. And the debriefing, we had um, some wonderful examples, a case study and Gordana's experience about debriefing, which can also be offered over the telephone. And in debriefing, there is some room for mutual feedback, which the guide also talks about. I don't know if you've ever considered that as an interpreter, giving a feedback to the clinician who, who perhaps wasn't as wonderful as Christine <laughs> and perhaps could have done things a little bit differently or, um, or better. Um, the stuff that the guideline talks about, um, work, about working with interpreters over the telephone is priceless, so I hope that as many clinicians familiarise themselves with the guide as possible because that would work our make our telephone interpreting work a lot easier. Now, um, the guide also recognises that um, the interpreter will use different techniques to deal with um, speech segments variations. So whether somebody speaks for, you know, non-stop and really fast, we might use chuchotage. Um, in long segments, we might cut in. Sometimes we might use note-taking and interpret longer consecutive segments, which happens particularly over the telephone. 
And lastly, um, with the specific points in the guidelines, group settings. You might have interpreted in family conferences when people talk to each other over the top of each other, don't stop, don't pause for the interpreter because so many people in, the, in that group might speak English. The guide, the guide actually encourages and clinicians to manage that communication, to pause and manage the turn taking so that the interpreter can accurately and adequately interpret everything. So it's fantastic to see that um, specifically spelled out in the guide. Um, in general, the guide, the guide provides useful guidance on, on what to expect and how to work best with clinicians. And it's so important to know what to expect because then we know what we can ask for also. And um, it talks about particular requirements of the healthcare setting. So it's important for interpreters, particularly those who work in the healthcare setting or intend to do so, to familiarise with th themselves with the guide. So you might be asking, how do I access the guide? Here's how. <laughs> so here is um, a very important slide. So take um, a few seconds to write down the website address. Here is where you can access the guide. Um, you can read through it and reinforce what we have presented today. And if you would like further information, you can uh, contact Migration and Refugee Health Partnership um, on the following email and phone number. So. Um, in just about a few seconds, I'm going to move to the questions that have come up on the iPad. Um, so as you're writing these website addresses and numbers down, um, I'm just going to start looking at the iPad. And excuse me, because I'm going to have to look down to read these questions um, down here. And I will indicate um, who um, I think this question um, might be answered by, but both Christine and Gordana are welcome to comment about these. So, um, first question uh, from Patricia, um, who first of all says, I'm thoroughly enjoying the webinar. Thank you, speakers, and thank you, Ossett, which is really good to hear. Um, more a comment than a question, and I'm wondering whether Gordana would like to comment on this first. Perhaps we should see saying that interpreting services are free. I think it should be made clear that it is the government who pays for interpreting services and makes these services available to cold consumers. I think the word free made endanger the idea that interpreting is easy and only bilingual can provide interpreting services, which is actually the wrong idea to have. <laughs> so what do you think, Gurbana? Well, um... I guess it's important for patients when accessing health services to know that they will not be charged for interpreter mm. services and that's why we, I guess, we have to use this commonly used term, free, so perhaps uh, the saying free of charge, but this is, I, I, I'm not sure um, whether this really undermines the qualities and, and the great work that interpreters are doing. Uh, because uh, even the services that doctors are providing in public hospitals are free to patients. That's a good point. Uh, uh, yes, but we, we never say I yeah. provide a free service. We say the government pays for this service. Yes. It matters. Yeah. So I, th I think yeah. that's a really good mm. point, Patricia. Yeah. And yeah. I actually usually say this is paid for by the government. Yeah. As a... Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, well, uh, Christine works for private sector. I work for public sector. So yeah. we are very used to using the term free uh, for patients. So that's well, but it, it's worth well, considering. It's a very strong point. If you spoke to GPs, they would not like, uh, bulk billing GPs, they would not like to be described as providing a free service. They provide a service that's so valuable the government ensures it, which is, I yes. think, what Patricia's yeah. saying. This is yes. a service so important the government will fund yeah. it. I agree, and yes, we are funded. Yes. The gov we are a, a government-funded service, the healthcare interpreter service. That's a really good point. I haven't thought about this before, um, Patricia, so thank you for that. Um, the next question is about briefing, so perhaps I should put it to Christine, and this question comes from, I'm sorry if I'm in, in, mispronouncing your name, comes from Sudas. Briefing is so important for an interpreter. Sometimes clinicians start talking about the patient as if we knew all the background of the issue. What shall we do in this situation? Um, uh, look, I, I, I certainly take your point. And I, th I, think, um, I, I think in this situation, um, uh, it, it's unprofessional for the doctor, the clinician, to leap into a consultation without telling you something about what's going to happen. 
Um, and I think um, uh, sometimes on the phone a a, a, an interpreter will actually stop and say, is this going to be a counselling consultation? So sometimes an interpreter will actually stop and say, is this... The, remember, I remember most of my interpreting is, is via an inter a phone. So sometimes they will they will say, is this veering into a mental health consultation? And then at that point I'll say, yes, I think it is. That case of Karim, we didn't know what it was going to be. And my briefing of the interpreter was, this is just this is a standard regular consultation. Uh, and then it veered into something different. Now, it was easy for the, us all to see what was happening. But if you're on the phone, sometimes you can't see that the patient has started crying in the room and it's about to change, uh, uh, change tack. And um, I think uh, um, I have no problem whatsoever. I think it is quite, again, professional practice for an interpreter to say, uh, or to ask for what kind of a consultation is this? Is this moving into a briefing consultation? Similarly, if I'm going to start, if the consultation moves into a, a reproductive health one and we're going to be talking about sex, I think it is appropriate to talk to the interpreter and say, now we're going to be talking about sex. We're yeah. going to be talking about something that's a bit intimate just so they can get themselves oriented. And um, if you can hear that that's what's happening and you're not being told, it is appropriate for you to intervene and say, is this going to be such and such a consultation? Mm -hmm. um, not that you want to stop it. You just would like to be able to predict uh, or, or to position yourself in the consultation mentally. Mm. Yeah. Uh, briefing is extremely important. Always in training, I emphasise the fact that interpreters can ask for briefing. Um, OSIT, um, the OSIT Code of Ethics is really strong on that and I'm very pleased to see that the guide recognises this as well mm -hmm. and says that interpreters can take a proactive approach and ask questions, ask, ask for briefing. And I, I should say that in presenting this guide uh, around the country to all of the um, health professional boards uh, who looked at it, Nobody has said it's impractical to us for briefing or we shouldn't do that. Nobody mm. has said that at all. Mm. So. Mm. It's, um, it's interesting, Lauren, because it emphasises the point how important, for interpreters, um, it, how important it is for interpreters to be familiar with this guide and also um, the guide for um, working with interpreters in the courts because some lawyers and I'm sure some medical professionals don't know that interpreters need to be briefed. And I had in a workshop uh, an interpreter shared a story with us how she was flown all the way from Sydney to, to Brisbane to interpret in a court case and was not briefed. They were actually refusing to give her a briefing when she asked for it. And then she was kept out of the court until day four, I think, and still not being told about anything. And then she found herself interpreting for uh, an expert witness from Italy via video link about something like engin engineering that she was totally unprepared for. And I said to her, here is the guide for working with interpreters in courts. Um, in the future, you can use it and ask for briefing before you go and use the guide as your supporting document as to why you're asking for it. And I think this guide can be used in a very similar way in the medical setting. I might move to the next question, and I, um, this one bothers me a little bit, um, and I wonder whether Gordana would like to um, comment on this. This is another question from Patricia, and she says, clinicians should also be encouraged and made aware that not all interpreters from agencies are trained or certified by NATI. The term interpreting is used very liberally. The term casual interpreter is starting to emerge in Queensland for untrained people. Especially in Queensland, more and more non-certified and untrained bilinguals are doing the work of interpreters in hospitals and health centres without a problem. All clinicians should be encouraged to ask interpreters about their NATI credentials. If they are not certified and or trained, they should document this in the patient's file just as they document when patients refuse interpreters. So I'm surprised and alarmed that this is happening in Queensland. Yeah, I can only, Patricia, I can only talk about the experience um, in New South Wales Health and we are the leading state uh, in Australia because we do have uh, a state-run healthcare interpreter service, government funded. Uh, what we also have in health is the, the, the policy directive which mandates engagement of professional healthcare interpreters in health.
and it preaches against the engagement of family and friends. So when it comes to New South Wales, we are doing all the right things and our interpreters, in order to become healthcare interpreters work and work for New South Wales Health, they have to have either certification from NATI and we are all aware that NATI certifies only up to 60 languages and for instance we provide the language services in 130 languages so what we have in health and and uh, anna is doing that she's our training coordinator for all healthcare interpreter services in new south wales we provide a two-day mandatory induction. So whoever wants to become an interpreter and speaks the language which is not tested by NATI, uh, they have to come through our mandatory two days training where Anna teaches them skills and techniques of interpreting. Uh, they have to know the Aussie Code of Ethics and, and the Code of Conduct for Health, etc. So we don't just allow people to go out there and interpret without having either certification or proper training. I can't can't comment on other states. It is unfortunate that other states don't have similar uh, similar service in place. And I can't comment about other agencies, but I am aware that many of the private agencies don't invest at all in interpreters' training. Uh, that's why there is a high demand for training provided by a professional development committee in New South Wales Health that Anna runs. And we offer 14 different workshops, which are all specialized for in medical interpreters. And, the, and, and now, because of the changes in uh, certification through NATI, the demand for these courses is, is even uh, higher. But I would like to see uh, all interpreters, no matter where they are, in which state of Australia, to have access to this kind of uh, training. It would be extremely valuable. And I'm really concerned that some interpreters uh, are called uh, medical interpreters in Queensland or in any other state when they have even no formal or informal training. Mm. Thank you, Cordana. We, we have a few questions here from Alona, who is an Auslan interpreter. Um, so I will read out the first question and I would like to put it to Christine and see what she's got to say. Um, you, I assume you've worked with Auslan interpreters in your time. Favourite, 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 favourite consultations are with Auslan interpreters. <laughs> I am an Auslan interpreter working in healthcare, says Alona. I find many healthcare professionals ask deaf patients if they can lip read or if they can read and write English. The purpose of these two questions is so that the healthcare professional believes an interpreter isn't necessary as they can, can communicate directly with a deaf patient. Some deaf clients don't know the reasons for these questions. How is it best to handle this type of situation? Uh, that's a very, very good question, Alona, and um, uh, I, th I think this points to uh, a, a real inequity for deaf people who, uh, who sign. Um, I, I think there's been a, a, compl a loss, in, in, it's a larger issue, but a loss of capability in, in the country overall, in all the institutions, in providing support for um, people who use Auslan. Um, uh, Auslan, uh, actually, NABS is very, very accessible. And it is a question, really, of... Um, um, I found that the, the best action for, for deaf people who sign is to say, get me a sign interpreter, and um, because they're so accessible. Uh, I think um, uh, relying upon lip reading, and we will be pushing this through on, on our side, on the cl clinical side, relying on lip reading for people who are not preferential lip readers is actually... Uh, um, uh, 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 convenes um, access around disability requirements. So, um, and, and you, you, you emerge with all of these kinds of difficulties with people who, who are not actually preferential lip readers but would rather sign um, with clinicians who prefer to, uh, to, um, to skip out on the interpreter. Um, in this case, it's really important that the, the person actually knows that they have a right to a, a sign interpreter in, certainly in clinical, in general practice at least, it is an accreditation requirement that they know how to access a sign interpreter and, um, uh, and that they can do that. You can do that on a, tele on a TV screen. It's, it's re really actually a surprisingly accessible service, I find. Uh, but it's in, in my own experience, it's been that it's been really important that the person themselves is actually quite active about that and that actually when they teletext, they text in to ask for an interpreter, uh, for an appointment that they say get me an interpreter at that mm -hmm. appointment so it can be mm -hmm. set up ahead of time. 
Uh, if they don't do that and they're in the middle of a consultation, the default position of a, of a clinician will probably be lip read me because they're, they're working so rapidly. It's hard mm -hmm. to get a sign interpreter on um, short notice. On, at short notice. So um, it's important that the, the service that they go to, the, the general practice, the hospital, whatever, and my health record is useful in this setting because my health record actually would, should... It doesn't contain... A, a, this is a point. It doesn't actually contain a statement mm -hmm. about interpreters on it. But actually, if, if the person is deaf and prefers, that can be added to it so that the system knows. It's a long answer to your question, Alona, but the basic, the bottom right, uh, the bottom line is that uh, um, it, it's their right to have a sign interpreter, and the systems need to be there to support that, and the person should ask when they make the appointment for it. Mm. There's another question from um, Alona, and I wonder whether I could answer this, and um, maybe Christine or Gordalam would have something to add. Um, another question. I have found on a number of occasions that it is assumed that I am the deaf patient's carer, not a professional interpreter. How should this be handled? <laughs> I, um, I think there is an answer in the, in the OZED Code of Ethics. I'm not sure whether ASLIA Code of Ethics addresses this, but the OZED Code of Ethics encourages interpreters to explain their role. So to me, this would be an instance for explaining to your role as a professional interpreter and not em and emphasise that you're not the carer for the patient. Is there anything you'd like to I'm add? I'm just thinking, to, just a simple thing to add, when, you work, when interpreters work in health, they wear their badges, so that would identify them as members of health teams um, and they wouldn't mm. look like carers, mm. I mm. guess. Mm. Um, I might move to the next question from Alona, and this one is a beauty. It's about the one to ten pain um, scale. Oh. We all, all interpreters <laughs> love this one. Uh, healthcare professionals often use a scale, um, one to ten, to measure things such as pain, feelings, and the like. The one to ten scale is generally not understood by deaf patients. Can, um, what can be done to alert healthcare professionals that the scale is difficult to interpret? We don't get a chance to meet the healthcare person to debrief before the appointment. So, two things. One, it's not just for the deaf patients. Um, across my language is Polish, and the patients I interpret for have a problem with the scale. And I've heard this from many spoken language interpreters as well. Hopefully, we do get the opportunity to brief with the health provider beforehand. Um, but even if we do, we might not know that this 1 to 10 scale will come up during the consultation. Mm. So, mm. Christine, how do you think this scale should be handled? Uh, look, I, 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 um, I think this is a really, really frustrating issue. There are, there are languages that do not use uh, 1 to 10. They don't use this notion of it's a little bit bad a little bit mm. painful and then it's super painful, which means it hurts me a bit and then it hurts me a lot. Other people will... Some languages um, uh, use a, um, a, a, an intensity scale, like it is incredibly intense. Other people will use... A, a languages use a length scale. It, it doesn't... Uh, none of these issues about pain actually translate across languages very well. And mm. I, I think you are well within your rights to say, I don't think they understand the scale. One of the problems with um, in, uh, uh, in, in Australian clinical practice is some of the zero to ten scales are mandated. For example, in, in some of the psych mental health, the K10 is, a, is used, sometimes uses some of these zero to ten scales, and that is supposed to be used in um, mental health consultations. But I never use it. I just say it's culturally inappropriate and don't use it. So I, th mm. I think um, mm. uh, you're not obliged to use them. And, and I, th I think um, if, you th if you think it is a meaningless scale, then you should use... You're a professional. You <laughs> inform the clinician about it. I will say that we're actually also starting to work with some of the pain physicians around these ideas, mm. that they, these yeah. are not cross-cultural ideas mm. that, uh, that don't translate very well. Mm. And the poor interpreter is left having to interpret repeatedly something, uh, uh, you know, it, this is only a little bit bad as opposed to this is profoundly bad. It's the same, it emerges, it's been emerging for years and years and years, same in delivery suites. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I've interpreted the scale into Polish so many times and I'm sort of jumping out of my skin trying to be so clear about what we're talking about here. 
And still the client doesn't get what, no. is it, what it is that we're asking them for. No, I, I've, I used to have this statement that uh, if, you, if you use the zero to ten scale as a particular culture, that if you used it in relation to moods, they would always end up on antidepressants because of the way they just expressed distress. <laughs> Not that they were depressed, it was just the, 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 the use of this inappropriate scale meant that the way that express was culturally distressed, uh, dis distress was culturally expressed, would mean that the person would be translated by a, an unaware clinician into being depressed and would end up on antidepressants, even though they didn't have <laughs> sure they weren't depressed. So I, I, I think... Um, uh, I think uh, clinicians are allowed to set aside those scales if they don't think they're culturally appropriate. Uh, in fact, the only, there's only one questionnaire that is regularly used in clinical practice that is, is cross-linguistically tested, and that's the one for postnatal depression. None of the others actually are valid across languages. So mm -hmm. you are within your rights, particularly mm -hmm. you know, if you're actually communicating across a sensory deficit as well, like as, a, as an oscillating interpreter, to say this doesn't translate. Yeah. We, we could talk about the pain scale for a long time. Claudia Angelelli, an academic from the States who now works um, in Scotland, wrote an article about the pain scale. So um, you might want to um, put that in the, in the search and see if you can get hold of the article. And now we have a question from Morena who... Um, it, this one is about telephone interpreting and about situations that are not appropriate for phone interpreting. Um, I wonder whether Gordana would like to comment on the questions because we hear often about phone interpreting being used in inappropriate situations. So what to do about phone interpreting in inappropriate settings? Elderly patients in hospital bed, confused by the process, police interviews with complex set of questions relating to time and place and precise wording and statements. I refuse these jobs as I don't believe they allow for effective communication. And I'm the, sorry, the name was? And the name is Moreno. Moreno, I don't blame you for refusing those jobs. And in um, health setting, in public health hospitals, when we provide interpreters for elderly patients and very often they have hearing issues, so we make sure, and clinicians are very versed with that after so many years of working with us, that they demand to have a face-to-face -face interpreter. So we do send face-to-face -face interpreter, and we are very much aware that there are, uh, tel there are uh, clinical settings where phone interpreting is just not appropriate. It doesn't work for mental health. It doesn't work for long assessments. It doesn't work for speech pathology. And there are, we, we generally, when we promote phone interpreting, I'm talking about public health, uh, because we have privilege of having interpreters on site uh, easily available. We, we always say that phone interpreting is uh, appropriate for quick follow-ups, for simple consultations, uh, but not for anything which is complex. Christine might disagree I, with yes, me because I, do. I have a different because, view here. Because, 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 yeah, because uh, in public health, we really have luxury. Our interpreters are available on site. And, uh, speaking about the, the service that I uh, manage, 85% of our operations are done on site. So clinicians simply have luxury of having interpreters on site most of the time. Yeah, if you had and, if you had an on site interpreter, or you were, you know, um, bilingual yourself as a clinician, that that's great. However, um, such is our linguistic diversity that. In the smaller regions, I'm from the ACT, we cannot rely on on-site interpreters. We, we used to employ uh, interpreters that the state employed interpreters who spoke six languages. But we would have 130 languages spoken in the ACT. So if, if you don't use a phone interpreter, then you don't provide an interpreted service. And this, the position that it is always best to use an on-site interpreter and that you shouldn't use them in a mental health consultation or you shouldn't use... That is used by clinicians as a, ref a, a, a rationale for not using interpreters at all, mm. all the time. One of the reasons why um, you, you see so few interpreters used is... But I'll, I get these letters back from clinicians saying, oh, I didn't use an interpreter because, as you know, the best form of interpreting is to have an on-site interpreter. We don't have an on-site interpreter, so we're waiting for that person to come back from Sydney. And we've a lot, three people have died while waiting for an interpreter to come back from Sydney. So I think my response there is, of course, you can decline a, a consultation, particularly if it's going really badly. But the issue there is actually the public hospital and its inability to provide a quiet space in which that consultation... I'll set aside the, the police one, because that's a different issue. 
But the issue, if, if uh, a sector, uh, and this applies to regional Australia or um, places like uh, the ACT, which do not have you know, sufficient capacity, if they don't provide telephone interpreters, then they're, they're not providing interpreting. So they have mm. to provide a, set, a setting that is reasonable. It's awful to be a phone interpreter in an emergency department yeah. with everything going on everywhere. So mm. there has to be some system. They have to devise a system. They, they, maybe they need a, 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 a screen on a trolley to take them and they need to go to a private space, which is the thing we've started to introduce in the ACT, in, so that they can use a phone mm. interpreter in any kind of professional way. Now, if you think that you can't actually do your job because it's such an awful environment, then you are, of course, within your rights to decline the job. But uh, I don't think we should decline the job because it's inappropriate to the, the, mm. the, the setting or the, to, the, to the type of consultation, because if we do, we are giving a message to, cons to clinicians that they can only have an on-site interpreter. And while that may be best practice for mm. many consultations, mm. Mm. if it's unachievable, they won't use a phone interpreter. Yeah. So yeah. It's, yeah. it's really good to hear this perspective. Um, there has been research in Australia, a research study that surveyed 465 interpreters, if my memory is correct, um, and many of them um, named a number of settings that they believe are not suitable for telephone interpreting. Uh, we're talking about telephone interpreting a lot today. And I always say in training that while we can recognise these situations, in reality we can't ban them or avoid them because whenever the clinician calls us for that kind of consultation, it is because they, they need to do that consultation right now and the phone is the quickest and the best way of doing it. There, need, there needs to be some recognition, though, that some situations are not the best for using uh, interpreters over the telephone, particularly when people are hard of hearing or when their communication is impaired, when they have a disturbance of thought, for example, in mental health, and they speak really fast and we have to do shushotage. We can't do shushotage over the telephone, so in that situation we might have to say, I'm sorry, but this is not working over the phone, and then decline. Yeah, for the following reasons. This mm. person appears to actually be psychotic, and uh, that's my professional opinion, I, that not, not that they're psychotic, but that I cannot follow their train of thought, mm. and therefore you need to find some alternative mechanism, yeah. method around this. And face-to-face -face we can use shushotage on the phone, we cannot interpret simultaneously, so it might not work. And if I can just add a quick comment, that in uh, New South Wales Health we are uh, working on trialling video interpreting, and we believe this would be the future of interpreting. Of course it's not going so quickly to replace face-to-face. -face. There will always be a need for face-to-face -face interpreting and telephone interpreting will always be in place. However, video interpreting would be probably the best and solution even, for those uh, I, I agree, situations. and TIS is also working on video interpreting yeah. and Victoria's mm -hmm. done a trial of it. And, and I think that, um, that, he, that he, uh, for many reasons, video interpreting, for one thing, is reasonably cumbersome. So you can't just hold your you know, your iPhone against their, their ear. You've got, you've got to have some equipment, which means you've got to put them into a quieter space. So yes. there's a lot of arguments yeah. yes. Yes. just around the structure yes. of the setting around video, for video interpreting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we've, we do have still a number of questions here. Um, I was worried for some of the webinar thinking, oh, there are no questions here. I wonder whether people are engaged with what we're talking about. But now we've got many questions. So do forgive us if we don't get to all of them. Um, there's a couple here that we can still answer. There's another question from um, our Auslan interpreter, Alona. Um, some deaf clients are not aware that they can request an interpreter when they visit their GP, uh, have an X-ray or a blood test. Some medical centres refuse to book an interpreter. Without breaking our ethics, how can clients be advised that an interpreter can be booked and how? Uh, that's not breaking ethics. That is an ethical mm. action to say that they can uh, get an interpreter. The GP that refuses to book uh, a, a deaf interpreter is actually um, breaking um, the, the code of conduct of the College of GPs and, and should not be accredited. Mm -hmm. So um, that they can't refuse that. So um, I think uh, anybody should be able to tell a, 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 a general practice particularly how to get them. The beautiful thing about NABs as opposed to TIS actually is that they can use NABs at, uh, um, to, to get an X-ray or, or in pathology. It's got broader application applicability than, uh, than uh, access to TIS. I'm talking about TIS because it's the uh, fee-free service that's most available to the community. Mm. 
Um, so, uh, Elena, I, th I don't think it's breaking professional ethics at all to do that. It is, yeah. in fact, it is a communication between one professional working in the health sector and yeah. other professionals working in the health sector. And you're not soliciting work for yourself? No, um, you're you're actually can. recommending a service that mm. can use another, um, engage another Auslan interpreter. And you're helping them out mm. from being sued mm. for being... Uh, <laughs> Here are some follow-up comments on what we've already covered. Alona says, lastly, many thanks. This is a very interesting and very informative webinar. She might have um, tuned out by now. Um, and Patricia says, in relation to um, the discussion about whether the services are free, we say bulk build, not free, for GP services. And... Um, and Patricia, Patricia also says, Christine, please move to Brisbane. <laughs> <laughs> Exclamation mark. <laughs> um, that's, that's fantastic. Um, now, um, Amelia um, asked a question about um, insurance doctors and um, who um, seem to be really misbehaving, but let's, let's hear the question. Consultant doctors for insurance companies in relation to compensation cases are generally rude, dismissive, and treat patients as if they are lying. There is no dignity or respect at all. I wonder whether insurance companies should be sent the framework and guidelines and encourage them to read them and take them into account. As an on-site interpreter in these situations, I feel very uncomfortable and embarrassed. The patients feel much worse. Thank you for a great seminar. Um, yeah, I agree. They should be sent yes. the guide. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, insurance doctors typically are horrible to many people. Yes. Not uh, even if they are. Mm. Uh, they they have excellent facility in English. But what a great idea to send the the. Yes. 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 And yeah. Georgia also commented: if clinicians are breaking all the rules, should we point them to the guide? Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> The guide has been endorsed by the, the health sector, so it's a really useful thing to do. Yeah. Um, so, yes, the guide can be very useful in many um, situations. Uh, Fwong um, Nguyen asks, in a teaching hospital, when patients see the registrar, most of the times the registrar has to go out and talk to the consultant during those instances. The patient is left with the interpreter. What do you suggest to overcome that situation? I'm pretty sure the guide addresses that. Yes. It does. It does, it, it does. it does address, <laughs> and uh, the, the guide advises that uh, if the clinician is leaving the room, they should ask the interpreter to leave the room with them rather than staying with the interpreter. Because as an interpreter, you would be subjected to a series of questions by the patient at that time, where they may take the opportunity to discuss their health with you. And then when the clinician comes back, they will say, but I've just told you, you can tell the doctor. You don't want to put yourself in that situation. So obviously, mm. as per this guide, you can leave the room together with the clinician. So if the registrar is leaving, you can just say, I will step out with you. And when you come yeah. back, I'll be back. Yeah. Yeah. I learned this when I started interpreting back over 25 years ago from my very experienced colleague. I noticed that in the outpatients clinic in one of the hospitals, whenever the um, doctor was stepping outside, she would step, would step outside and wait in the uh, outpatients corridor until the clinician came in. So I'm really pleased that this guide recognises that because it's a really good practice for, um, for interpreters and if doctors could take a lead in that and taking the interpreter out with them, that, that's really fantastic and useful. Um, Okay, another question. This one is from Vicky. Um, on uh, a couple of occasions, I have been waiting in the area for interpreters only to be told by admin persons a little later that doctors have made use of accompanying relatives to do the interpreting. And I think this is a question for Gordana. Whose responsibility is it to educate the health sector? <laughs> <laughs> it is um, it is a very uh, it is a question which is very close to my heart. Uh, I'm very passionate about this topic because uh, up until 10 years ago in New South Wales Health, we had a mandatory training for all new uh, staff who would uh, enter the New South Wales Health uh, sector. So during that training, we would tell them that we, uh, wherever they work in New South Wales Health, they have access to healthcare interpreters. They just need to know the number to call and they would be available at any time. Uh, what happened, unfortunately, 10 years ago, there was a new system where all the education went online 
and through that system they've forgotten about us so we are actually um, not not the, the we are not able to provide training to all healthcare providers in New South Wales Health because we just don't have capacity. There is not enough of us to go out there and teach them. And also the reality is that the turnover and, and influx of new uh, staff in the hospital is happening on a daily basis. So I'm currently fighting um, on behalf of all healthcare interpreter services to have a mandatory training for all clinical and admin staff in the hospitals to be available as a half an hour mandatory training on online on Hetty and um, hopefully that should happen sometimes in the future and then we will make sure that all clinical and admin staff know at least the basics about uh, interpreter mm -hmm. services. I, I run some education sessions for clinicians on working with interpreters. Um, it would be wonderful if they had access to um, Christine <laughs> to train them. Yeah, I, I'm not. I mean, I, I don't, I've been in this training clinicians for 15 years, and, and I, I would say that um, training alone isn't enough. Um, mm -hmm. That yeah. um, that the systems have to be stronger. Yes, that, I mean, yeah. the hospitals mm -hmm. need to be accredited for against how sensitive they are to interpreters and. Uh, and if you're going to train, you have to get into medical school. So every student yes. that we have who graduates at the ANU Medical School has to have an experience of using an yeah. interpreter. They have to. That's a requirement. Now, mostly that is telephone interpreting, but they have to have done that. Mm. Um, and that that's absolutely yeah. wonderful, yeah. Christine, because I always strongly believe that uh, no matter what capacity health may have to educate doctors, new doctors, when they come through the system into hospital to work, the best way actually to prepare them is to make them aware during their medical school studies that there is they have to work with interpreters, that the, the way how to access interpreters and how to work with them, and then they come to the hospital prepared. Yeah. This way we are just, it's impossible. Like New South Wales Health has... Um, thousands and thousands of employees. I can't talk about New South Wales Health, but I know in Western Sydney there are 11,000 employees. It's a huge organisation and we have no capacity to capture all of them and educate them. Mm. But just getting back to that particular situation where you're waiting and, and, and then for this uh, consultation that you're going to interpret at and, and then you find out that they've used the family member, um, uh, I think that's a very difficult position for you to... Um, to advocate, mm -hmm. but uh, it is important, I think, that somebody knows about that. Yes, um, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. if this was happening in public health, we would expect the interpreter to go back to either uh, their coordinator, and we have a coordinator of, of our sessional interpreters, and just raise that concern with them and leave it with them. Then eventually it comes to the manager of the interpreter service who will then go back to that department and say, hey, there is a policy in place which mandates engagement of professional interpreters. Family can't be used. Mm. You breach the policy, basically, okay. and you are running mm. a, a huge risk. Mm. So there is a way for that to be raised. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of comments here, rather than questions, we'll, uh, which I will just read out. Um, Patricia said, New South Wales and Victoria are streets ahead in um, ahead in only engaging NATI certified recognised interpreters. Unfortunately, this is not the case in Queensland, where almost anyone with good English and good CV, but untrained and non-certified, can get work as an interpreter. It's a risky practice and clinicians are not aware of this lack of credentials from interpreters they work with. I actually see this in hospitals myself. It's also discouraging for us NATI certified practitioners. I couldn't agree more with exactly. that. That's very um, disappointing. And Cameron um, has a broader um, comment on training. I'm based in Western Australia. Perth, is it possible to have more legal and medical workshops for advanced level of interpreting and translating in the state by Ozit? Thanks. Um, let's, uh, I hope that Ozit takes note. I would love to go to the Western Australia and <laughs> deliver an advanced workshop on medical interpreting. And um, a very valid question from Alona back in relation to um, briefing. How do I arrange to have a briefing with a medical professional? Hospitals and medical centres seem to be just too busy to have a briefing with the interpreter. Good question. So the way that I, I work in a mainstream general practice in, in a hospital, and in a specialist service, so it's, it's easy in a refugee health service, we're supposed to do that sort of thing. We know that some of the consultations can be damaging, so we would do that. But uh, it, uh, a mainstream general practice, it's, it's um, pressured uh, 
So, um, uh, and again, this relates to systems. So, and, and so these are the kinds of systems that we're trying to make part of accreditation. I'm, I wrote the accreditation standard for general practice and I think we're trying to make that stronger and stronger. Um, in order for you to be able to get briefing, you have to be there before the patient is. So it, it's important that um, the systems work that way. Uh, I always get pe the people at the front desk for a phone interpreter to ring and so that uh, I, bef with the patient in the waiting room, so then I have the chance to talk to the person on the phone before they come in. But if I was, um, and with the patient, the times when the person um, uh, uh, is deaf with Auslan, usually you're walking in together. That's usually what's happening. And so um, yeah. I, I would usually in the corridor actually say, I think this is going to be about such and such a topic. Now that's not a very complicated, that's not a very strong briefing, but at least I've done that orienting um, in the corridor as we're walking in. Mm -hmm. um, I do recognise that that's difficult, and uh, but I don't think it's beyond um, a healthcare system that can do brain surgery yeah. that they can <laughs> work out how to do this. <laughs> but uh, at the moment, I think this, 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 the practice of actually calling an interpreter while the patient is in the room means you can't be briefed, really. Yeah. And, and so we have to think of different ways of doing that. Well, I think I, I would suggest um, take every opportunity that you can. If you're interpreting for an inpatient, you're often encouraged to go and see the inpatient before the doctor is paged. Um, stay at the nurse's station and wait for the doctor. Then you can have a chat before you can actually yes. but before you go and see yeah, the um, yeah. the patient. Together. Yes. Don't 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 get sent mm. in by the nurse to sit beside them because you'll end up in this situation that Cordana's describing. Yes. Where mm. you and then and you, you're effectively saying, I am really a bicultural worker or a health advocate. So no, mm. if you stay outside and then wait to meet them, then it's. Mm. A, yeah. Got a couple of comments on the previous discussion from Evelyn. She says. Um, this is about a pain scale, um, how she would possibly m um, maybe make it more comprehensible. Zero, no pain at all. Ten, labour pain if female, or being shot in the knee if male. If male. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, Evelyn. I think clinicians should, um, should say that. Yeah. Um, Maria says, sometimes the younger doctors on their rotations working with consultations are totally cross-culturally incompetent. Hopefully this new guide will train them before they're actually seeing cult patients in public hospitals. Oh, um, inshallah. I hope so. Let's hope so. <laughs> um, we'll just answer a couple of questions and then we're going to, um, we're going to um, move on. But here's a comment that... Um, wrap up, I mean. Here's a comment um, that I absolutely agree with. Maria says, please don't use interpreters. Work with or engage one. Tools are used, not people. Absolutely, and this guide reflects that. We're steering away from the old terminology of using interpreters. We engage them now. They're not at all. Um, now, here's a question that's really um, valid and it talks about family conferences. I have been in a position where the clinician has not taken charge of the situation when the family is talking over me and is trying to do my job. How can I tactfully talk to the doctor about this? Um, uh, we have the Healthcare Interpreter Service has produced a video on this and the family working with interpreters in the family conference. We were hoping to actually show it today, but as you can see, there was no, not enough time for it. But we're suggesting that, that if the clinician um, doesn't take control of the situation, the interpreter can raise a concern, perhaps by raising their hand. In our video, the interpreter is actually banging on the table to get attention, <laughs> which is probably extreme. But in the first instance, you can try and do shushotage, simultaneous interpreting, but if situa the situation is too much out of control, um, there is nothing wrong with you as an interpreter saying, I'm sorry, I cannot keep up. Can everyone speak one at a time? Yeah, mm. yeah I, I would yeah. agree. Yeah. It's a situation that often doctors are not so experienced uh, with handling. That's why we put out that educational video and the guide recognises that as an, as an issue too and, and offers some guidance to clinicians, which is really good. I think a sign that a clinician isn't going to take proper control of a consultation is as often when they start using second person. Can you ask her this? Yes. Can you ask her that? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> mm. yeah. um, a question from Georgia, who is um, a Greek interpreter. Another question which is culturally inappropriate is the advanced care plan. Elderly Greek people are horrified when I ask this question. 
What can be done, as I believe this should be explained to them and there is not enough time in a consultation to break it down for them? I can't explain it for them as then I will get into trouble. So what is left? Culturally yes. um, inappropriate, the advanced care plan. That is a really, really good question. Um, and um, I, I think um, uh, an advanced care plan is part of the standard aged care assessment, which is done for everybody over the age of 75 in general practice. Um, uh, well, it should be, you know, it garners and generates some income for GPs to, to do it, and it's good practice. However, the, uh, there, I mean, I think most interpreters have had the experience of uh, having to interpret an aged care plan and the person just being horrified mm -hmm. that you're talking about abandoning them <laughs> and, mm -hmm. you know, not... Um, and so uh, the, um, the, the aged care, uh, the uh, advanced care plan sites in most states will have some kind of multicultural support service. So um, uh, in order to provide extra support for... Um, people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. I think it is a really difficult thing to interpret. I don't actually have a solution for you, except that I agree mm. that it's difficult. Mm. And the, the, uh, all states and territory and national governments know that it's difficult because we know that this is the group of people who are least represented in advanced care planning and therefore um, sometimes may be at risk of having a horrible death in intensive care that hasn't been planned for. But... I don't know that, I mean, it's not the interpreter's job here <laughs> and yeah. um, mm. it, that, that reflects more about cross-cultural capabilities of clinicians, I think. Mm. Well, Alona says many thanks for answering our questions, much appreciated. Um, I would like to apologise in advance to those of you who won't have the, your questions answered because we're running out of time. So I think I'm going to go on to the last question. Um, this looks like an interesting um, story. Um, Jack um, asks... I once had an assignment when the nurse asked me to pick up a tube of blood she dropped on the floor and asked me to sign the patient's initial for her. I directly declined by saying it is not my job in my job description. How can we let the nurse and doctors know that we are only here to facilitate communication? Earlier before the assignment started, they even, uh, sorry, earlier before the assignment even started, they asked me if I can stay with the patient's children rather than interpreting for the patient just because they think the patient has enough English proficiency. I was really shocked. <laughs> I would have been too. Uh, we are Jack, all shocked. <laughs> hmm. So uh, just to interpret what was going, uh, just to medicalise what was actually going on with the signing the uh, initial they would have been uh, in order if if somebody takes blood, they have to in a hospital. They have to sign that they took the blood, and then somebody else is supposed to countersign it. It's not your job to countersign it. It's their job to get somebody else to countersign that another nurse around. So that's a misinterpretation of of your role. But it's interesting. One of those roles you're being treated as a health clinician, which is the signing, and the other one you're tre being treated as. Um, a, a nanny. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Uh, it, it speaks to, I think, the importance of, of um, uh, being clear about boundaries. That would have been a very difficult one to manage. I Absolutely. Think. Yeah. And about explaining our role and what mm. we can and can't do. Mm. Um, one comment on what we have discussed already from Hanya. I'm so glad you mentioned not leaving interpreters alone with patients. Years ago, as a young interpreter, I was left alone to tell a man that he was dying system shutting down due to no further antibiotics working. I didn't know I could refuse, so I somehow muddled through. It was distressing with no debrief afterwards. I still remember it vividly. Mm. So we've got some examples coming through of when sometimes, and this one happened some time ago, um, when health providers we're working with, not just the patients, but also health providers don't really understand our role and what we can and can't do as interpreters. So I see a huge place for the guide in explaining our role. Um, I hope that the guide gets to as many clinicians as, as possible to educate them and to make your job as an interpreter easier so that you're not asked again to... Uh, pick up vials of blood and initial them so that you're not asked again to stay with a dying patient alone and explain what's going on. Um, you are a professional interpreter. There are boundaries which you are aware of and we want the professionals we're working with to be aware of these boundaries as well and what our role is. And I think this guide is fantastic and a really, um, you know, way forward. Um, it's the best guide for 
clinicians I've ever seen in my long career. So well done to Gordana and Christine and the whole team that you worked with. Um, and I hope you access the guide, have a look at it and spread the word. Um, thank you. Any, uh, any other final comments before we... No, uh, thank you. Thank you for your wonderful questions and um, thank you for the... Thank you for spending two here. hours Thank with us. Thank you Thank for you. the questions, and I wish we had time to answer all of them, but unfortunately we've run out of time. So um, thank you again, and hopefully we'll meet again in another forum to tackle the other questions that we haven't looked at. Thank you.